So, hello to everyone. My name is Fabio Tacone, I'm from Brussels. I have the pleasure to chair this session, this session of eISSM about COVID, what we have learned. And of course, I have the big pleasure to share this session today um, with very distinguished speaker. Uh, from the left to the right, in the upper part, you can see Ricardo Ferrer from Barcelona and Elia Zule from Paris. And in the lower part of the screen, you can see Artus Vlaski from Toronto and Giacomo Grasselli from Milan. Uh, so I will try to make some questions and uh, uh, we will join the discussion with our experts and try to go through some uh, uh, lessons learned during these COVID pandemics. Uh, so starting from the qu first question, I think from the pathophysiology of this disease, we have read many, many, many papers. And I would like to ask to maybe Ali and Giacomo to have uh, their idea, maybe starting from Ali, uh, is it an heterogeneous disease? Is it an homogeneous disease? What, how can we define it? Is viral sepsis and maybe your idea about main pathophysiological mechanisms? Thanks. Thank you. Good morning and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, yes, I believe that it is a heterogeneous disease. I think that there are clinical, biological, radiographic parameters that make that the presentation for every single case, every different case is very different. One, according to comorbid conditions, uh, based on how important is the inflammatory reaction, but also how deep is hypoxemia when we are looking first at the patients, either in the ED or in the wards, um, we have uh, different ways to estimate what are the, the likelihood for the patient to be critically ill. And when the patient is critically ill, how we can manage the patient according to uh, the ways we are going to provide uh, mechanical ventilation whether we can use a non-invasive strategy like high flow nasal oxygen or if we are going to have earlier intubation. The other thing is, are there any elements, biological elements, for example, that can presume that the patient is going to respond to anti-inflammatory therapy or if the patient is early after the, the onset of their viral symptoms, whether the patient would need an antiviral therapy. For now, we know that the strategies that have been tested have been, have been tested for everyone without making the difference whether we were in the first week or in the second week after the virus symptoms, whether the patients are with high inflammation or low inflammation, and whether the patients have high d dimers for example, and are at very high risk of uh, venous thromboembolism. So I would say that uh, based on clinical and biological parameters, uh, according to imaging and mechanical findings, we could, could identify identify different targets for managing the patients. I'm passing to Giacomo. Giacomo, maybe you can also have a, explain your idea about phenotypes. You have this very nice paper on Lancet. Yeah. Recent, maybe you, have a, you can explain us which is the concept of phenotyping COVID-19 in, in critical ill patients at least. Yes, um, you, I, I, I guess that you all know that, that uh, uh, based on some observation from, from Luciano Gattinoni and John Marini, it was proposed that uh, uh, respiratory mechanics characteristics of, of those patients can be um, distinguished in two different phenotypes. One which is characterized by low elastance or high compliance. So uh, an, an important um, uncoupling between the severity of hypoxemia and the severity of the respiratory mechanical compromise. And the second one, uh, which is the, the other phenotype characterized by low compliance, which is more similar to what we think of classical ARDS. So these were very interesting observations, but based on limited number of patients. Then if we look at the literature that came out uh, after that, we can found a very, as Lee was saying, a rather heterogeneous distribution also of, for example, respiratory mechanics. So we, we, we found median values of compliance between 20 and 60 ml per centimeter of water. And clearly this can be due to several reasons because the, 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 the disease is heterogeneous, heterogeneous because there is it's the dif different timing and treatment before the ICU admission. So this we, we still don't know. But what is true is that, for example, in our, pa in our paper, we, we've on around 300 patients, we found a unimodal distribution of compliance. So the median value of compliance was 
28% higher than the median value of compliance in a, of a reference group, which was taken by uh, taken from the the the, the um, LangSafe and the Berlin Definition database. But still, we, we, we saw a very wide distribution of compliance, and only 5.7% of the patients, of COVID-19 patients, had values of compliance higher than the 95th percentile in the classic ARDS. What we really found different from what we call the ARDS is that uh, in uh, the lung safe, for example, database, there was a clear relationship between the severity of hypoxemia and uh, compliance compromise, while in our COVID-19 patients, the median value of compliance was basically the same in mild, moderate, and severe ARDS. But uh, we also did CT scan analysis and what we and uh, and biological characterization. What we found was that patients that were characterized by low compliance and high D dimers had much higher mortality than all other patients. Uh, in some way, indicating that there is uh, both a vascular endothelial damage uh, and, and the dimers may be a proxy of that and also a, a, a epithelial alveolar damage. And when both damages combine, then uh, the, the prognosis of the patient is worse. So it's much more complex than what it, what, what it looks like. And maybe Art wants to say something. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in. Uh, the, th the three things I think I've learned, a number of things, uh, many things I've learned. One is, in fact, I think that the mechanics is, is actually very similar to, to classical ARDS. Um, if you look at the study that Giacomo just mentioned, there's a study from Spain with intensive care medicine with 750 patients roughly. The, the mechanics are, are roughly the same. So I think it's very similar. I think well, the reason we were fooled, if you like, to think that it was very different is we, we're seeing 10 times, 50 times more ARDS than we saw in the past. So you see a lot of unusual cases and you notice it because you see 10 times as many. The second thing is, as Jaco mentioned, I think that the other thing that I've learned is sort of the, the thrombotic nature, that this disease is not just a respiratory disease, it's a multi-organ disease, likely related to the ACE2 receptor and, and the virus latches onto the ACE2 receptor to get into cells and that affects in the kidneys, the heart. Um, so thrombotic events are important. And the, the last thing, not really mentioned, but you know, I, there was a lot of talk at the beginning about cytokine storms. I don't think there's very good, strong evidence. In fact, the evidence I've seen suggests that cytokine storm actually doesn't happen very much in in, in, AR, in, in COVID ARDS and COVID respiratory failure. Which is very much in line with the apparent failure of the tocilizumab, which is an ISIS blockade to improve outcomes That's in this right. patient. And I think that the, the pathological findings that have been reported in many different autopsy studies are very much into pointing out this heterogeneity there are epithelial damage, there are endothelial damage, there are also steroid responsive uh, uh, lesions that make that we are we can now understand why ventilating these patients differently according to the, the clinical presentation and why uh, starting steroids uh, for most of them makes a very big difference. Yeah, and probably uh, I, I can also add that uh, as for sepsis, maybe the immune response of the patients make also a large contribution to the heterogeneity of the disease, as we observe from, uh, from other situations. I would like maybe to jump, because you discussed the pathogenesis, I would like to ask now to Ricardo Ferrer. I think, Ricardo, we had a webinar together, and he, he explained his experience. Uh, I think how many, how many patients COVID-19 you had in the ICU, and you had the days with 20, 25 admissions a day. Uh, what's your strategy today? Which is your best, best medical care, except for ventilation in these COVID-19 patients admitted to the ICU, what's your opinion? Yeah, to, to link my, my comments to the previous presentation, I think this is a great opportunity to learn about pathophysiology because it's the, it's the first time that you have a single microorganism causing RDS and a viral sepsis. So uh, usually when we talk about sepsis, we have a lot of heterogeneity in the, in the, in the back. In the microorganism, in this case, all the heterogeneity seems to come from the host. So the different genetic background, the different comorbidities, and um, and other issue probably we are we are seeing such a different heterogeneity in the in the um, in the presentation uh, of patients in the ICU and in the hospital. Um, anyway, a, a factor that seems to be very important is viral load. So uh, we learned that patients, most severe patients, have higher viral load, 
and also that patients in the ICU, 80% uh, of them in a, in, a, in a paper we are going to publish very soon are viremic. So uh, the use of antivirals while we wait for the vaccine should be, uh, should be one of the, uh, of the pillars of the treatment of this condition. Uh, and hopefully uh, we have used a lot of antivirals uh, during this uh, outbreak, um, just based in biological plausibility or just based in, um, in a small observational studies. And at this stage, maybe, uh, maybe we can discuss with the rest of the panel, but maybe we can say that uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine alone or in combination with acitromycin is not, uh, is not playing a role. So we are not giving those drugs anymore, but we have used a lot of these drugs at the beginning or during the first wave of these uh, outbreaks. Uh, lopinavir, ritinavir, also we have give a lot of we have gave a lot of these of these uh, anti retrovirals, but uh, again uh, there is not evidence supporting uh, the use now of, of this uh, combination. So by now, uh, I think that uh, we should base our therapy in prendesivir, but um, uh, the use in patients in the ICU, I know it's controversial, so I would say that they use it as soon as possible in severe patients in the wards and, and make sure that the patient receives the, the, the treatment very early. And also uh, there is some discussion about uh, convalescent plasma. I think that uh, the controversy is if uh, adding some antibodies, external antibodies helps in patients that in fact are producing normally antibodies, so it seems that it would be redundant, but probably there are a subgroup of patients that can benefit. So at the end, like in many other therapies in intensive care, we will finish personalizing some of these therapies and selecting um, subgroup of patients that could benefit because the, the rest not. And, and the other part is the host, how to modulate the host response. Uh, Ellie has comment about tocilizumab, but maybe we can discuss of asteroids, uh, if it could work or not. So I leave the word to other members of the panel to discuss about asteroids that have much more experience than me. This is a very important point that have been just discussed. Uh, I'm sorry. This is a very important point, as uh, in my experience about immunocompromised patients that have CD8 effect and prolonged viral shedding, we, we may have a different uh, look at the use of antivirals and on uh, convalescent plasma. We have been using them not only because the patients were sickest, but also because they were not able to clear the virus and we had a prolonged course of disease and we, we were looking at making everything to stop the, 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 the viral shedding. And uh, maybe, as you just said, uh, Ricard, we, we need maybe to think differently in a group of patients, like maybe the elderly or patients who are with CDA defects, uh, as compared to the general population. Very good point. But what about uh, doctor? Maybe, yeah, a couple of points. First of all, I agree, agree with a good point, Ricard, about, about now we have ARDS with a one, one, one pathologic feature that, that we know, and that's always been a problem with ARDS in so many, mm. so this makes it very interesting. So mm. I, I would say a couple of things. One is um, steroids, and I think there's very good evidence now there have been the, the UK study, the, rec the recovery study that was published in the New England Journal last month. And then the meta-analysis just came out in JAMA last week. And the World Health Organization came out with a guidance uh, just two, three days ago that I think is very useful. And essentially, if, if I would summarize it, I would say patients who are, uh, who, the sicker they are with respiratory failure or ARDS, I think definitely should get steroids. Um, Low-dose dexamethasone, we don't know it doesn't have to be dexamethasone. It looks like the meta-analysis, there wasn't much of a difference. Patients who are on supplemental oxygen, let's say saturations less than 93%, uh, the World Health Organization came down with 90%, something like that, I think should also get steroids. Uh, there's a decrease in mortality. And patients who are not that sick, who, who don't need supplemental oxygen, I don't think there's evidence that they should get steroids. In fact, that there's evidence they should not get steroids. The mortality actually trended higher so I, I think that's a pretty clear message now from my perspective. May I, may I maybe uh, raise some concern about uh, something yeah. that you said? Because I agree with Arthur that uh, with steroids, now we have studies and we should rely of uh, well-conducted randomized trials also to understand how to manage 
the general COVID-19 population. Now, the question I have for all of you, how uh, in the pathophysiological of the pathophysiology of this virus, you can expect to have an even better response combining dexamethasone or steroids with, for example, tolicizumab or other immunosuppressive drug. Is dexamethasone enough? Uh, should we put all these other drugs apart? Or we can still, still think that the combination of these drugs is an issue in some of these patients. I don't know what to make this. Go ahead, Ellie. I think you're going to start. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, we, are, we are thinking on different therapeutic strategies. When we look at the pathophysiology based on autopsy studies, uh, there are very clearly organized pneumonia. There are sensitive, there are uh, uh, an alveolitis uh, made from lymphocytes. Uh, and a group of uh, pulmonary lesions that are considered to be responsive to steroids. For those patients, we can also understand when we have uh, an alveolitis uh, which is vegetant, uh, that this patient should be managed uh, be with a very long protective strategy as well as on anti-inflammatory disease. The funny thing for tocilizumab that may targets another uh, epithelial endothelial activation that is quite later in the process, uh, is that we are uh, uh, taking experience of the cytokine release syndrome that we can see related to drugs or to many uh, medical conditions. But look at the data, for example, when we are using uh, cell therapy with CAR T cells. And in CAR T cells, we have true cytokine release syndrome. And as just uh, has been mentioned earlier, the level of, cy of cytokines are 1,000 higher than in COVID-19, where the level of IL-6 is about 100. So we are targeting something that is very uh, uh, stimulating intellectually, but is I think we are upset of the, the clinical data, not only in the true CRS, uh, where tocilimab doesn't bring more than apirixia, and in COVID-19, I think it's it just uh, uh, ineffective because it's not the right target. There is uh, an inflammatory reaction, but it's not based on IL-6, uh, and maybe we should consider having maybe different subgroups of patients, like for example, maybe high CRP or maybe very early uh, pulmonary involvement uh, after a viral uh, symptom onset, uh, so that we can target uh, IL-6 in a very selected number of patients, but of course not in everyone. I would be interested to see not only the results of pooled uh, trials on tocilizumab, that to the best of my knowledge are not available in the literature today, but also to see how these results may uh, actually apply in specific subgroups of patients with high IL-6 related inflammation with high CRP or high uh, IL-6. Can I maybe ask it to Giacomo? Um, because of course, Italy was one of the European countries who was hit the first and very hardly during these epidemics. And my question is with your experience and looking at the literature, are you going through a personalized approach, which means you combine together with dexamethasone in critical patients other po potential effective drugs, or you still stick to the evidence-based medicine and you only use, for example, dexamethasone and all the critical interventions that we know that are effective, like protective lung ventilation, which is your, your approach? For these new, let's, let's say, second wave, or these new patients that we are treating, we decided to stick with evidence-based medicine. So we still measure ferritin, IL-6, and so on, but uh, we try to, to we, we try to reserve those drugs in, uh, in, in within the context of clinical studies. So what we do now is dexamethasone, remdesivir as soon as possible, especially before the ICU. And we should not, I think, forget anti anticoagulants, uh, especially in patients with the high D-dimers. So what we do now is that we, we, we use, let's say, uh, some, some high level, high, high level of, of uh, prophylaxis for, let's say, all patients and full anticoagulation in patients with high, with high D-dimers. So this is what we do now, plus protective yeah. ventilation. Maybe so, I can make a point, Fabio, as well about, uh, you know, I think I agree with Giacomo that anticoagulant seems to me a very high long possibility. There, there's clinical trials that, that are ongoing looking at this. And I think it's a shame that we haven't done more RCTs. I, you know, I think that's, that's where you look at the, you have to hand the UK group a lot of credit. They studied uh, thousands of patients in a short period of time. I think that we should really focus on getting RCTs to get definitive, more definitive evidence. You know, if you look at the US, convalescent serum was mentioned. 
70,000, I think, or 80,000 people have received convalescent serum in the U.S. There's no, there's no data for a randomized controlled trial. It's still, we still don't know. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and, and, and I think, you know, I think anticoagulants probably will turn out to be the case, but, but there's a trial ongoing. All the sites, we should get people involved in these trials. We'll, we'll know the answer in a couple of months. So I, you know, I would, I would really focus strongly on we should be doing more RCTs. That's critical. I would like I maybe to, should... sorry, please, Ali, please, Ali. Just, just a, a very short comment. Uh, I think that anticoagulants are not evidence-based because the, the best of what we have is a subgroup analysis in a retrospective study. I think there is a very strong biological plausibility and we do it and I agree with everything that has been said, but this is not specific to COVID. And in classic uh, non-COVID RDS, there are thrombotic lesions. And Absolutely. in the past, they have been, we have, we have had the trials on anticoagulants in RDS. Uh, so not everything is true. And uh, if I had to expect something, I would expect that the anticoagulant trials would be negative. But I think that, uh, as just Art said, we have uh, countries where the trials have been very, very strong, the UK, Brazil, and uh, uh, many parts of the world. And we, we expect uh, uh, trials from there. And trials are also very important also for safety reasons. I mean, most of these drugs like tocilizumab steroids have problems with super infections. And I think it's something that we have to pay more attention to. Yes. Very good point. Maybe very, very quickly, because as we discussed before starting, in some countries, hydroxychloroquine plus minus azithromycin is very much used. Uh, can we very rapidly say to the people that are listening to us whether you use it? Yes, no. We don't use no, it. No, 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 no. Okay, no. So maybe, I mean, for those who are very really big believers, <laughs> listen to the experts in the critical ill field, they are not so in favor of using this intervention. Very clear. So um, I would just to move on because you discussed about ventilation and Arthur discussed it first. Giacomo introduced the concept of optimizing uh, protective ventilation. Um, are there any lessons, specific lessons to COVID-19 that we have learned which are different from common management of RDS? Maybe Arthur want to start. Well, I, you know, I, I would, uh, it's an interesting way you worded the question. I would say that uh, I think at the start of the, the pandemic, um, largely based probably on Gattinoni's uh, hypothesis, people were starting to ventilate quite a bit differently. They were, they were intubating earlier. You know, this, the Gattinoni study suggested not using prone position, maybe using higher tidal volumes. Um, I think that the more we learn, the more we stick to what we know and what the evidence has shown for non-COVID related areas. That, that would be my take that uh, it actually, in terms of, the mechanics is very similar to what we had before. And that doesn't mean you treat all the patients the same, but you treat the, there's a, the, even in routine ARDS and in, in class play ARDS, there's, there's a broad range of, uh, of mechanics and gas exchange. And I think you use the same, same approach. One thing I think that at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, there was a lot of negativity about uh, using ECMO. You know, studies out of China suggested mortality, I think, greater than 90%. There's a paper coming out. Um, uh, Ryan Barbaro is the first author coming out, uh, looking at over a thousand patients from the uh, ELSO registry. And the results are interesting. They show the mortality, 90 day mortality is estimated to be a little less than 40% in these patients. The median uh, PF ratio on entry was about 72, so similar to to the OLEA study. So I think that in, in experienced centers, when patients are failing mechanical ventilation, and if there's appropriate, if there's enough resources available, because it is very source intensive, that ECMO should be considered as a, you know, a reasonable, reasonable alternative. You know, it's not the first thing you do. And, and certainly in, a, in the midst of a pandemic, you have hundreds of patients in your ICUs, that might be not the best use of resource, but the outcomes seem reasonably, reasonably reasonable. Thanks. Yeah, Maybe Jacques or, or Ricard, but don't know who wants to add on top of this. No, I, I mean, just to share our experience, we treat 24 patients during the first outbreak with ECMO. Uh, our mortality was 37%. And I have to say that the main risk factors for mortality were duration, previous duration of mechanical ventilation or those patients that were put on ECMO because of secondary complications like necrotizing pneumonia, super infections. 
So uh, in the early phase of RDS, if the patient has severe hypoxemia, I think it's a, it's a good strategy. Uh, Giacomo, maybe um, do, do you have a specific strategy? Maybe you change your strategy for the use of non-invasive ventilation in these patients because we have heard a lot about not to use it, risk of aerosolization, use it as, soon, as far as possible. How has changed your practice over the time, over the weeks, and how you use today non-invasive ventilation in these patients? Well, the, the, the issue of non-invasive ventilation in AR. Yes, or in general, in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, it's, it's always been debated because we know that if it succeeds, patients have a better prognosis because they avoid the complication of intubation and invasive ventilation. But if, if it fails, especially if you delay intubation too much, then the, the patient prognosis is worse. So it's always difficult to find the balance. So what is very important is to monitor the patients. But for example, what happened in Italy, in Lombardy especially, we were so like overwhelmed by patients that we basically had to admit to the ICU only intubated patients. And for one intubated patients in the ICU, we, we were following in the world at least the same number of non-intubated patients that we were assisting with nasal high flow, or you know, in Italy it's very popular helmet CPAP or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And uh, what 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 we saw basically what we, we were forced to see because we were doing something different from what we usually do that we use from position for example in non-intubated patients and we had to we had to we had to use uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation for a prolonged period of time uh, in these patients and uh, we did not see uh, an extremely high rate of failure we have a paper uh, just submitted together with Giacomo Bellani on, on 900 patients at the treated with non-invasive ventilation strategy and basically the, the, the failure rate was about 35 percent. Uh, 20 percent of the patients were intubated and the, the remaining 15 percent of the patients were not intubated because they had decision of limitation of care. So and some patients had been managed for with non-invasive ventilation or CPAP for four or five days and what we saw also in our paper in JAMA Internal Medicine was that um, uh, of the 300 out of 4,000 patients treated in Lombardy, of the 300, and those who failed has been, had the same mortality as the patients uh, intubated, while those who did not fail, uh, I mean, those who were treated only with non invasive ventilation, also in the ICU, had a much better prognosis. So, what we do now is that we, we, in, in patients who do not need immediate intubation, we try uh, our first approach is helmet CPAP because it delivers stable levels of PEEP, free flow CPAP, and uh, it probably also reduces the risk of contamination. And, uh, and then what is very, very important is strict monitoring of the patient for signs of failure and to detect early signs of failure in order to avoid the delayed intubation. Fabio. Yeah, sorry, it was, uh, so just, um, uh, I mean, we, we discussed a lot and uh, I think that uh, many things you have said. Unfortunately, the, the session will only last 30 minutes. So I would like to stay with you for hours, days, but it's not possible. <laughs> so just to conclude, I mean, the last uh, point, which is very critical for our colleagues, maybe a very 30 or 30 second words from each of you, how you manage the surge in your own country, which were the issues, the main issue that you, you found. 30 seconds each of you, from Ricard, Eli, Arthur, and Giacomo. Well, uh, uh, I don't want to talk about the past. I think we, talk, we should talk about the future. The future will be uh, to attend COVID patients together with non-COVID patients in a setting where a lockdown is not possible anymore and where healthcare workers will be scarce. So we, we, should, we should try to organize the ICUs in this setting to have 10, 15, 20 patients on the top of the rest of non-COVID patients. And this, of course, we need more ICU beds, more uh, intensivists, uh, and more equipment for that. I'm just jumping on this comment to say that more ICU beds uh, means more people, more trained nurses, and more specialized uh, uh, doctors in intensive care unit. That is not something we can invent uh, in two days or two weeks. Uh. So managing the surge have been to use every possible bed, uh, but of course, not all the patients were managed by ICU specialists. And I would be very, very reluctant with uh, political discussions that say that we can plan to organize 20,000 beds uh, if there is another surge. This is not true. 
Critical care is a specialty, and we need to train people in ICU care to provide the, up, the optimal critical care for every patient. Arthur? Yeah, my only comment would be, I agree with what's been said. We should be trying to, to prevent the surge from happening. We were pretty lucky actually in Toronto and Canada so far. We had some cases, but not nowhere near uh, catastrophic number of cases. And I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but we should be doing everything we can making sure the, the communication, making sure this doesn't become a political issue. It, has, it appears that many things, whether it be wearing masks has become a political issue. So anything we can help our colleagues in terms of communication to try and prevent the surge would be uh, a key thing in addition to, of course, all the, the things that Ellie and Ricard mentioned. And very Giacomo. Yeah, for us, it's basically the same. I mean, the government decided that we have to increase by like 50% the number of ICU beds uh, but again, an ICU bed, as you all know, it's not only a bed and a ventilator and a monitor, it's also a, a, a team of, pe of people who are trained to work together. And this is very, very difficult to, ach to achieve in a, in a short period of time. So uh, this is the, 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 the main issue, because during the first, uh, during the surge, we, we, we were able to, uh, to go in Lombardy, for example, from 700 to 1700 beds. But again, we had to we had to send patients from to from from big ICUs to very small ICUs, or even to hospitals who did not have an ICU, and, and in some way put some patients in the operative room. And what we saw was a, a very very important difference in mortality. Like we, we had in our center, we had like 25 percent of mortality, uh, and, and they were all intubated patients. And in other centers, 85 percent mortality. And I, and I can tell you that patients were basically randomly assigned to the, to the, to the centers because we, we had so many patients that we were not able to select the, 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 the right place for, the, for that patient. So in, in some way, at a certain point, we were sending one patient where there was a bed available. But that was very, very clear. I mean, one ICU bed is not, uh, in, in one hospital, is not the same in another one. We, we know this, we've, we've known this for many years. So the experience of the people who are caring for the patients is extremely important. We cannot uh, create ICU beds just because the government wants us to create new ICU beds. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks to Giacomo. Thanks to everyone. I think I have, to, I have learned a lot from you. It was very interesting discussion. So I would like, of course, to thank Ricardo from Barcelona, I live from Paris, Arthur from Toronto, and Giacomo from Milan. <laughs> of course, I will uh, virtually thank all the people that will listen to us and are listening to us now in the EISM and of course enjoy the meeting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.